How does Hardy make use of the natural world in Tess of the D'Urbervilles? Thomas Hardy's 1891 novel Tess of the D'Urbervilles makes considerable use of the natural world in order to create sympathy for his heroine Tess Durbeyfield. He does this in three significant ways. First, he suggests that Tess is a vulnerable part of the natural and pagan world. Secondly, he does this by comparing her to a number of animals, uh, notably hunted birds. And third, he uses pathetic fallacy to align his heroine with the landscapes that she inhabits. It's logical to begin with the character of Tess as we find her at the beginning of the novel. She's dancing in a pagan uh, celebration of fertility. The paganism Tess clings to and gives in to at Stonehenge later in the novel is a form of worship of the natural world. We are told that, quote, every woman and girl carried in her right hand a peeled willow wand, and in her left a bunch of white flowers. The wand clearly connotes a spiritual belief that is not Christian, while the flowers connote a close connection to nature. Thus, from our first meeting, we see Tess is closely connected to a worship of the natural world. And this is the first major stroke of characterization by Hardy. It's reinforced when he notes that her natural beauty, again, is associated with nature. He describes her mouth as a peony, P-E-O-N-Y, a flower. However, she is marked out from the other girls on account of the red ribbon that's in her hair. It's strikingly vivid against her white dress. Quote, she wore a red ribbon in her hair and was the only one of the white company who could boast of such a pronounced adornment. The symbolism is clear. Tess is immediately connected to notions of love, sin, lust, and blood. Tess's connection to the natural world is present at the turning point in the novel when she is seduced or raped by Alec Durbeville in the chase. Here the natural world welcomes her, is peaceful, and allows Tess to sleep, or at least to doze while her fate is undone by Alec. Hardy describes the scene, quote, Above them rose the primeval yews and oaks of the chase, in which there poised gentle roosting birds in their last nap, and about them stole the hopping rabbits and hares. The tone here is disarmingly calm, perhaps reflecting how unaware Tess is of the danger she's in. Hardy seems to be critical of Christianity when he goes on to explain that while nature was undisturbed, no god intervened to protect Tess. He says, but might some say, where was Tess's guardian angel? Where was the providence of her simple faith? He's making the point that nature is indifferent about human suffering, and that Tess embodies this idea. The weak will be preyed on by the strong in the human world as they are in the natural world. Following the trauma of the death of sorrow, Tess briefly finds new life at Talbothay's farm, and is even recovered enough to fall in love again and undergo a full sexual awakening. Talbothes is a farm surrounded by fertile, quote, thyme-scented green slopes, and the associations with fertility continue throughout. While Hardy, Hardy says directly that Tess, quote, felt akin to the landscape, she felt like she belonged to it. The cows that Tess milks are described as having, quote, great bags of milk swinging under them as they walked, again, reflecting the fertile landscape. And it's important to know that at this phase of Tess's life, it's three years after her return in disgrace from Trantridge. She is nearly a full-grown woman, and the phase expounds on her sexual maturing. When she walks through the garden to hear Angel play his harp, she is described as a cat, and the language of the scene is unmistakably sensual in detail. Quote, the outskirt of the garden in which Tess found herself had been left uncultivated for some years and was now damp and rank with juicy grass which sent up mists of pollen at a touch and with tall blooming weeds emitting offensive smells, weeds whose red and yellow and purple hues formed a polychrome as dazzling as that of cultivated flowers. She went stealthily as a cat through this profusion of growth, gathering cuckoo spittle on her skirts, cracking snails that were underfoot, staining her hands with thistle milk and slug slime, and rubbing off upon her naked arms sticky blights which, though snow white on the apple tree trunks, made madder stains on her skin. Here we see Tess connected and at one with pollen, blooming weeds, a profusion of growth. These are clear metaphorical references to Tess's sexual growth. In addition, we see her white skin symbolically stained, suggesting her purity has given way to something else. And finally, Hardy makes use of alliteration with heavy emphasis on a hard C, a soft th sound and also susurrating S's, which force a reader to physically feel the sensations in the mouth. The language itself in this passage is deeply sensual, not just in its meaning, but in the way that it is formed by the mouth. 
Throughout her time at Talbothys, we see Tess achieve a kind of happiness because she is blooming as the world around her is. She seems to be at one with nature, supporting the notion that Hardy sees his heroine as a kind of pagan earth goddess. The setting's pathetic fallacy seems to embed Tess within the setting, as though she herself and her emotions were as much a part of the landscape as the fecund hills. The cows of Talbothys are just one of a series of animals that Tess is closely associated with. Her sense of obligation to her family is heightened when the family horse is killed. When she works at the slopes, it's to look after the poultry and the birds. She is raped among a setting of rabbits and hares. She falls in love, surrounded by cows, and fleeing from Farmer Groovy. She is compelled to kill a clutch of pheasants. Of these animals, perhaps the birds are the most interesting. Of the birds described, all are either killed or imprisoned, and there seems to be a clear symbolic connection here, not just between Tess and the birds, but between the vulnerable and the strong. Again, this seems to reinforce Hardy's Darwinian perspective, that the weak cannot survive in the face of a natural world that is indifferent to their suffering. There is also a feminist comment to be made here that the majority of the weak characters in the novel are women, dependent on the whims and caprices of male predators. The pathetic fallacy of Tess at Talbothys is inverted at Flint Camash. Here, Tess's misery at Angel's absence and the impoverishment of her family are reflected in the hard and unforgiving landscape and the work she undertakes. The fertility of her previous happiness is replaced with barren lands and, quote, the stubborn soil around her showed plainly enough the kind of labour in demand here was of the roughest kind. Word choice here gives a succinct view of the setting, stubborn, and roughest suggest misery that is to come for Tess. The scene with the pheasants is especially worth closer analysis as it makes clearer the notion of Tess herself as a bird and it suggests that the character is aware of the similar fates that she and the birds face. Tess awakes from a nest she has assembled under the branches of a tree the night before she had collected quote dead leaves till she had formed them into a large heap making a sort of nest in the middle. There's an unpleasant irony that the pheasants she finds had fled wounded from a hunting party, just as Tess had fled. Previously, Hardy had also described Tess as hunted. The symbolism is explicit, it's very clear. The pheasants and Tess are the same. Again, though, Hardy returns to his theme of an indifferent nature, saying that Tess and the birds were, quote, weaker fellows in nature's teeming family. Here the word teeming suggests a mass of life so large and uncontrolled that it cannot stop to look after its weakest members. It's perhaps at this point that Tess accepts most fully her position in Victorian society. Her natural beauty is what makes her desirable to predators, and the natural world tells her that the predators will usually win. Tying together the pagan and natural associations that Hardy uses throughout the novel, Tess accepts her final fate at Stonehenge. It's appropriate that our heroine offers herself up here. The site was believed to be a pagan temple and a place of sacrifice, and we're told of the landscape that, quote, the band of silver paleness along the east horizon made even the distant parts of the great plain appear dark and near, and the whole enormous landscape bore that impress of reserve, taciturnity, and hesitation. Taciturnity meaning uh, to say little, but or only as much as is needed. The tone is solemn, but perhaps it suggests what Tess feels, that there's nothing more to be said. Tess goes to sleep on an altar here, suggesting that she has accepted the gods of the natural world have demanded her life, and that she is willing to offer them the sacrifice rather than struggle to escape it, as she has over the course of the novel. It's here in the wide open plains that Tess seems to achieve the only peace in her brief life. She understands the nature of the predator and hunted world, and she is willing to die in order to end her own suffering, like the pheasants. By portraying Tess in such close connection with the natural world, Hardy achieves a number of objectives. He characterises his heroine as a thing of beauty, whilst also showing that what makes her beautiful is also what makes her vulnerable. He's able to develop a reader's sympathy for Tess as he develops her emotional connection to the landscapes she inhabits. The pleasure of life at Talbothys encourages a reader to believe that Tess can be happy, while the ferocious misery of Flint Camash reinforces the unhappiness of Tess. Finally, by constantly associating Tess with animals, and birds in particular, Hardy is able to offer symbolic representations of his point of view. He suggests a Darwinian perspective on the natural world, and by placing Tess at the centre of it, he indicates that she simply is not strong enough to survive. If you want the transcription of this, or have any questions, www.mrconnor.com, or you can tweet me at MrConnor1. Thank you.